was the beginning of the 83-84 season and we had engaged Michael Tilson Thomas to conduct Mahler Third Symphony. His agent phoned us and said that, that he wasn't able to do the concert and I mean we were in a real pickle. We'd booked a huge orchestra, the concert was sold out and we didn't have a conductor. The then managing director of the Philharmonia Orchestra, Christopher Bishop, uh, was taking his time. Uh, the interesting thing was that actually there were quite a lot of well-known conductors being suggested for, for it. I think in the end, Christopher looked at the video that I had and he looked at it and looked at it and looked at it and he showed it to members of the, of the board of the orchestra and they talked about it and they talked about it. And I think in the end, they just couldn't resist it. I got there that, that first morning, the day of the concert, in fact, and uh, uh, I asked the principal trumpet and trombone what was happening. And they said, oh, we've got a young chap from Scandinavia, apparently. Nobody's ever heard of him. Nobody's ever seen him. And the only, the only people that have seen him are the management. And uh, they've seen a bit of him on a videotape. He arrived. He looked very, very young, very young. And um, immediately, I was impressed. He was fully in command. He knew what he wanted, in other words, even at that tender age that he was then. And he made us play out of our skins, really. I'd been in the orchestra for about two weeks. <laughs> and this was someone sort of my age who was actually standing up there, this incredible control of a symphony orchestra. If you look at it in there, in cold daylight, actually it was an outrageous decision to make, which happened to come off very, very well, because as a Becker just is extraordinary. And to cut a long story short, the concert was terrific. It was so exciting, and Asa Becker was such a performer, and it was marvellous, and he got rave reviews in the papers. His magnetism in concerts um, is, I think, obvious to audiences and, of course, to us. And his commitment both to us and the music throughout those concerts and the rehearsals is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, he's on our side. He helps us play. We're, we're all working in the same direction. He's simply a superlative conductor. He's got huge, innate musical ability, which is the cornerstone of everything, and doesn't accept the status quo. So you can work with him both as an artist that has an extraordinary relationship with the orchestra, but as an artist that's also really fascinated by where this art form goes. And for me that's incredibly important because we have to remember that the symphonic canon and the orchestra is Western Europe's greatest gift to this planet, I think. And Sullivan was at the heart of that. And he's concerned to take that forward, to rejuvenate, to reinvent. And that makes it an inspirational relationship for the orchestra and of course for me. Uh, this is not my analogy, but somebody said that Esa conducting us is like he's driving a really fast car through the mountains and trying to see what he can make it do. And that's what it feels like in the concerts. And it's just exhilarating to be part of. If you look at him conducting, he's so into it. He's sort of like in this trance-like state. And, and you look at him and you see his enthusiasm and his energy, and you can't not go with it. His perception of the world is quite exceptional. And I, 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 I'd love to discuss with him you know, any topic. We are very different, but I really I um, appreciate his vision of the world and the way he discusses things, you know, especially art and music. Um, we, we don't necessarily have the same taste, but I always, I'm always interested in, in his um, vision and reading of, of things. <laughs> his rehearsals are very, uh, there's a lot that goes on that is completely unsaid. And he chips away at superfluous things 
to reveal whatever score we're working on. And often that, that reveal, as it were, it doesn't come until the performance, doesn't come until the concerts. What's coming out of him is like he's actually written the pieces himself. It's brilliant. He's got that um, talent. But it's nice being a part of something that's where no one could possibly play an, a fraction louder than it is. You know, you look around and cymbals and brass and everything is going absolutely crazy. It's good. <laughs> good rock is fun. He never seems tired, and even if he does seem tired walking into the room, he's always bright-eyed when he actually gets on the podium. And I think that's inspiring for us. If we're tired, as soon as he's giving everything, you can't help but respond to that. Um, when I'm playing for him, I want to play the best I possibly can. And I think we all feel like that. Asapaka, it's always a pleasure. Here's to another 30. I hope to be back for the 60th.